Seth, you want to go ahead and say the blessing? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this, within this facility. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the word tonight. God. Lord, we ask that your anointing be upon the preaching tonight, God. Lord, we just thank you, thank you Lord, for your word, God, that the preaching goes forth tonight. God, we pray for receptive hearts, God, that uh, we can uh, remember this word and reflect on it the rest of the week. And apply it to our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this all thing. Lord, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm getting ready here. You know, I always like to take time for prayer requests and and uh, praise reports and and uh, so if you got either one of them, now's a good time to to bring them up. Greg, pray for Jess. She's home, sick, kind of crashed out on the couch. And been fighting it for like a lot of people have been, but she's pretty out of it tonight. Pray for healing long term. Right. Let's do that, dear Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you that. Lord, you always have an open ear and an open heart to, Lord, our concerns and, and our struggles, no matter how big and how small they are. And, Lord, tonight we just ask for a touch upon Jess and others like her, Lord, going through the cold and the flu season, that, Lord, that you touch her, that, Lord, that you will relieve her of the symptoms and, and heal her body. Let her know how much she's missed in your presence, Lord, and we'll just glorify and praise your holy name. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Anybody else? The uh, uh, I promise you that I'm not going to keep you as long as John did Sunday night. <laughs> you know, my, my mind is still, it's like a belt that's been slipping, <laughs> trying to take everything in that, it, that, you know, not only Sunday morning, but mostly Sunday night, because truthfully, that was way out of the box for me. I mean, I, I, I would assume it was for a lot of people, uh, but the more that you think on on it and grasp it, you know, it's a, it, you can kind of get a little bit of an understanding, especially when you apply it to the Word. Um, I, I really enjoyed John. I thought it was a great service. Amen? Amen. Pastor will be back Friday, and uh, I'll warn you, come Sunday, you got to remember he's been gone for a while, so I've used this term before. He's like a milk cow that has been milked in three days. <laughs> so he's going to be full of something. <laughs> and don't anybody let him no, that John preached till 20 till 9 on Sunday night. Because <laughs> it could set a precedent. <laughs> I think really that uh, uh, Pastor Terry and John have a little thing going about being long-winded preachers. And uh, I think John might have one-upped him uh, on Sunday. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Jeremy? Conversation quickly went from me needing services to uh, what God's been doing in his life. And it was just really neat to see how he came. And this guy is I'm not real sure his age is in his 40s. So he's been part of the Amish culture for 40 some years. And that's not something that he's decided one day to decide to go. But he said, God, he's a true Amish man. And I could tell there was something different about him. He just had a look. And uh, we talked years ago. And uh, anyways, I saw him last fall. And I, and I was told that he had kind of stepped away from the Amish community. All those still lives in that area. And uh, obviously his house and just the things about him, you know, are still what a person like us would assume to be honest. But uh, when I talked to him on the phone today, the love that the, the love that this guy has in his heart is awesome. And uh, I mean, he was, you know, we were talking about the Lord, and he was just evangelizing over the phone. And it was crazy. And uh, the conversation turned to my dad because he's a good friend of my dad. And my dad, his, his kids look up to my dad. And my dad they spent a lot of time together. And, uh, anyways, he, he proceeded to tell me. And it just it encouraged my 
my spirit because I knew it. Uh, sometimes when we need encouragement or we feel like we're walking alone, he'll send somebody along to encourage you. And the very words that you've been thinking or praying about be the very words that they delivered into your spirit. I mean, it, that isn't happenstance. We all know that. I mean, the more that you mature in your Christian walk, you realize that, it's, that it is of the Lord and that he wants to give you a little pep talk and encouragement along the way. Amen. Anybody else? I, uh, I'm having a little trouble getting started because it's been a cold day. <laughs> and when you're, when you're out in it, it kind of wears you out, amen. I think everybody is, uh, the one song we sang and uh, the grass was green up there and I'm thinking, oh Lord, please, one of these days will you deliver that unto us because we're ready for it, amen. Amen. Um, you know, I want to thank you guys too for coming out tonight and Wednesday night, you know, um, you know, well, the Lord will reward it for you. We will reward you for coming to listen to a kid that's playing on the reserve team, still trying to find the anointing and lean on the anointing, completely understand it, and be able to talk and, and have um, thoughts that run concurrently and not all over the place. And that's a real struggle for me. And I, I know that he's got a lot of work to do in me. And I appreciate you coming out and being faithful to listen to what the Lord's laid upon my heart. So I want to thank you for that. And so tonight we're going to talk about, I think, something that's very basic for everybody. And it's the cross. You know what? I don't think we can ever lose if we're going to talk about the cross. Amen? And before I get into it, when I was doing this study, because I had started it for John to come in, I just can't get away from the Sunday night service and, and him talking about the different levels, dimensions and, and, man, I really think about the way he was talking about how the concept of Christ being in our lives and seeing the things that are going on and that we can perceive. We talked about it Sunday night at McDonald's, you know, and, and uh, till we closed McDonald's. <laughs> but it, 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 it just kind of falls in line when you start thinking about the things that, have, that Christ is going to do or has done and put those perspectives in our lives and how it's right now on time, but yet it could have happened a long time ago. We think it did, but for him it's right now. I, you know, hey, I got to get out of that discussion because I'm going to get stuck in John and, I, or John and the way he was talking. And, and for sometimes I had to kind of gather it and he was two sentences down the road because I couldn't comprehend it. But it really made me think. And it really made me have a different understanding of the way maybe the Lord works and the angelic work, and even the, the demonic world works. You know, so it, get, it gave me a different understanding. So we're going to go to Luke. We're going to go first to, uh, uh, if you want to get your Bibles out, we're going to go to Luke uh, 22. And uh, um, you know, all the Gospels have a, a, a concept or a story of the, of, the, uh, of the cross or the crucifixion, but I want to start with, with the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're going to start in Luke uh, 22 verses 39 uh, through 51, and uh, let's see, let me, it says, uh, of course, we all know that you know he had just gotten done with the Last Supper, and and he had already told the disciples that somebody was going to portray, uh, uh, betray him, and uh, so this is this is kind of where we're at. It says, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was uh, withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. 
And he knelt down to pray and saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours, your will be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthened him. And this is one of the passages right there where automatically I'm thinking, you know, sometimes we forget that God knew what was going to happen. He knew that the very next thing that was before him was going to be a physical pain that he had not endured because he was man now. And that, that pain was going to be overwhelming. But the, I believe the biggest pain was him knowing that when he, as he's approaching the cross, that he's taking the sin of the world upon him. That's the biggest pain. That's why I believe the darkness that had, had uh, I don't want to say, had, had been come pressing down on him, he's starting to realize that now. And, you know, and I've read over this passage time and time again, but, I, you know, sometimes I forget, but it says, then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. See, even God needed encouragement during his time of a struggle. And here he is getting ready to, knowing that he's headed to the cross, but God sent an angel just to encourage him so that he knew that, that the next steps he could endure because he knew that there was a bigger prize before, laid before him. Then 44 starts with, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. And he who had called Judas, one of the twelve, came before him and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of God with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this, and he touched his ear, and he healed him. It's another sense for me that in, in, in the Lord Jesus' greatest time of trial, that he reaches out and touches and heals. One of the very last things that he does is before he goes to, to trial and for the beatings and the crucifixion, but yet he still had the compassion to take care of a, of a servant's ear. So we're going to go to the crucifixion, and it's going to be in Luke 23, 32 to 46. We're setting a little bit of foundation for what I've got up the road here, but like I said, you can never, you can never fall short reading over the, the cross and the crucifixion and the things that the Lord did for us at, at the cross. Uh, it's going to be Luke 23, 32 through 46, and it says, There were also two others, two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast his lots. Another sense of the Lord showing compassion upon man, knowing that in, our, in their little minds that they were still not understanding that they were sacrificing the Lamb of God. The, so you've got to remember, they're just, they are just putting forth the plan that's been set before the foundations of the earth. Because this plan has been gone, had been gone on long before this society had ever even come into uh, reality. Because the Lord knew that he had salvation waiting for man. And you know, he chose the t- this time to be crucified on a cross. You know, it could have been years ago and he could have been in an electric chair or, or something like that. But he chose this time to be crucified, one of the most horrible deaths that could ever happen to a human being. Uh, let's see where I'm at. Where did I stop? 35. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is a Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the, others, but the other answered, 
answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? For we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And that's a, and that's a very interesting verse because the, the, uh, uh, the sixth hour is noon. The ninth hour is three o'clock. And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a reason for that. Because the night, sir, the night sacrifice was to be done at three o'clock. So the Lord, I mean, you just read over that, you don't understand it. But when you get an understanding of the Levitical code and, and what went on in the sacrifices, you're understanding that, that the Lord has taken that sacrifice, the sacrifice that's going to be done in the temple, at the same time that he's being hung on the cross, that he gives up the ghost. It's the, it's the, it's the same, it's, it's at the same time. And that's why what's happened next is the, is the very same thing. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And we understand that, that the lamb could not make, that sacrifice could not make us go before the Lord. Only one person could do that, and that was the priest once a year. But with Christ, he broke, out, he broke down that wall of division and give, let us, allows us to enter in to the throne room of God. Amen? Grace. It's just amazing that when you read over this and, and, and you get an understanding of what grace is and, and what, what, ha- what He took on Himself for us. Uh, let's see how far we've gone. 44 to 46. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out into a loud voice, He said, Father, into Your hands I commit My spirit. Having said this, He breathed His last. See, then we understand that, that, that how Christ come on the cross to, to, to fulfill the pre priestly sacrifice. That was a physical sacrifice, but he took the physical and took it into a spiritual realm. And upon that cross, you know, it was, it was uh, Christ that, that, that after that sacrifice, after his death, and he went to the spiritual realm, that he went, you know, the Bible tells us that he went down into paradise and preached, preached in paradise. That he overcame the spirits of the, the, the grave and the death and the grave. Amen. He gave the church the keys to that. Um, and, and, and in John, when he says, you know, on, in 46, it says, Father, into your hands I committed myself. But in John 19.30 it says, you know, Jesus said, it is finished. See, for all the times that, 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 that the priest from the Old Testament and the sacrifices and different sacrifices he had to come up with, slaying the lamb, slaying the ox for this sin offering, that sin offering, you know, for the seasons, you know, the, 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 the feast of the unleavened bread and, and so forth and so on. It was finished because Christ became that fulfillment. So we realize that as Christians, you know, what the cross has done for us is to bring us into an area of grace, unfair to, uh, unmerited favor, where upon believing in what Christ Christ has done for us at the cross. Not, not, not the cross, but at the cross. And the salvation that he gave us is the reason we can stand in church and testify that we are good enough, that we are righteous enough, not because of who we are, but because of what Christ did at the cross. Amen? Yes. And that's what's going to bring me into my, in the next section of my message. Like I said, I wanted to lay a little foundation because what I see right now in this world is... is, is an attack against that cross. And more so every day. Not only the cross, but the Christian and his beliefs. 1 Corinthians uh, um, 118 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? I'm going to read that one more time. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. But in today's society, the cross has become an offense to the outside world. It wasn't that long ago that I, I heard uh, a commentator talking about the cross 
and the way society is attacking the cross, the way our judicial system is attacking the cross. I'll give you a couple examples. The, the cross at Mount uh, Soled, Soled in San Diego, been there since 1954, ordered by a judge to be taken down because it's on public land. Now, now that, that cross has been there to honor the fallen dead in, World War, in the World Wars. But yet one judge says it's unconstitutional. So it's being taken down. The Mojave Cross on Sunrise Rock and the Mojave Natural uh, National Preserve in California. Same thing. ACLU has per, has persuade has has pursued getting this cross taken down, and a judge backed them up. So what what happened is Congress says, okay, we can overcome that. What we're going to do is we're going to privatize this little section of ground, this rock, so that 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 cross can stand. And uh, um, of course, then they were sued again. This, this has been an ongoing battle. I mean, eight, ten years. And so the ACLU sued again. Well, this judge says, that's all right, because they won't be able to tell what's private land, what's public land. So with this Congress passing the law, they've allowed to keep the, the uh, cross up. But there's only one problem. The administration we set underneath right now, they won't transfer the land. So what you've got right now is... is, is um, a holding pattern, even though the cross is up, it's covered up. And it is actually, they got a picture of it, as you see it on the, on the internet, where they've got plywood over it and they got it covered up. Because this administration won't allow it to happen. See, there's been an attack on Christianity in this, in this country. And I think everybody in here is going to believe, you know, believe me when I say that. These are just examples of, of, of that um, just today, I, I heard a report of our attorney general our, our, that said that he, he told the state attorney generals that if they didn't want to uphold the, the law, they didn't have to. That if they wanted to allow same-sex marriage, even though it was unconstitutional in their state, they, they would allow them to do that. See, that's wrong. I mean, because constitutionally that's wrong. But yet that's the that's administration we're sitting under right now that is against Christians. Amen? I'll give you an example. Camp Marmau in uh, northern Afghanistan. There's a cross that's set over the chapel. And it had set, it was, of course, I think it's just a tent, so, but it was erected on a pole, and they were ordered to take it down because the regulations of our United States government forbid that cross being erected or staying up when service wasn't going on. Now, they're allowed to put it up when service is going on, but the second it, the service is over, it has to come down. They have the same ruling for, for uh, uh, the Star of David, uh, any crucifix, um, the menorah. But in that regulation, there's no mention of a dharma, which is a Hinduism symbol, uh, the pentagram or pentateuch, which is the satanic worship, the star and crescent, which is the Islamic. There's no, there's no regulations for that, but just the Christian. Isn't it amazing? Doesn't, that, doesn't you make a wonder about what's going on in this country? You see the offense of the cross to those that don't understand the cross. It's, it's an offense to them. And they want nothing to do with it because it's foolishness to them. Any? You know, uh, I, I think as we look at the devil, I think his greatest work is to take the church from the cross because that's where he was defeated. And if you take the cross out of the Bible, you have nothing else but man's ways and yep. man's ideas to follow. Yep. So that's what he done to the church world. Yep. We're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's all right. At least I know you're listening. <laughs> And, and here's one that I really thought was an amazing is I was reading in the internet and, and talking about and taking crosses down and, and, thing, and even, even any Christian uh, symbolism in the, in the public eye and how it was being attacked. In Britain, there's a, there's a case that is going headed to, they don't have a Supreme Court in Britain. It ends up going to the European Grand Court or something like that. But they have a case in Britain where two women were fired. One was a nurse, and one was worked for the airlines. And they were fired for wearing crosses. And uh, uh, so while they're setting up all these, you know, the 
testimonies and everything like that. This paper come out with a deal saying they had a group of ministers, that, and this was this was their quote, and it, and and I just want you to listen to it. It says uh, an article in the Sunday Telegraph discloses that uh, ministers were ready to testify that the cross is not a requirement of the Christian faith. Now, the cross is not a requirement of the Christian faith. So employees can ban the wearing of the cross and sack workers who insist on doing so. See, now we know that the cross is just a symbol. But, and a lot of people just wear that symbol because somebody gave it to them as a gift. But for some of us, the cross is so much more than a symbol. And it is our right as Christians to bear that cross. Matter of fact, I think I've got it written down later. You know, they, the Lord tells us to pick up our cross and follow him. Amen? Our Christianity is, is completely under attack. And, and in this world, we're, we're, uh, we're going to have to defend the faith. We're going to have to stand up on the fact that, that you know, we're not going to take a second seat or let the government tell us what we can and cannot do. That's the very reason that the pilgrims come to the United States. It's the very thing that's going on in this United States now. Amen? You know, it, the world's one thing, but the church is another. And here's two stories that I, that, that I know, one I, one I know and the other one that I heard. But the, there's a pastor in Illinois, and the church was having financial problems. And they didn't know what to do, so an Islamic group approached them so they could have their services on Friday in the church. And the pastor agreed. Well, they came in and says, you know, hey, it's a great building and everything, but you've got to cover the cross up. And he did that. He was willing to do that. Now come, that's God's house. That's God's house. But yet, so many churches, so many churches have no problem with taking the power away. Amen? We all know, I, the next story is we all know there's a, there's a large church in Texas that uh, was started by this fellow's dad. And it grew enormously, especially after his dad died. And they went to a, a, a I think it was a Staples Arena or a Staples Center, but it was a great big basketball facility and made it into a church. When they made that move from that church to the big church, they took the cross out and put up a symbol of the, of the world behind it. Now, to me, that's, that's the right understanding. That's, that's the right reason because that's the way they are. They've become the world. You know, and his comment, I've heard it time and time again on the TV, is, you know, we're not here to hurt anybody's feelings. We want everybody to feel welcome. Well, you know, the word is offensive to people. The Word is convicting to people. You know, the Holy Spirit isn't going to let you set in your sin and save your soul. He's going to convict you of your sin to save your soul, right? He wants you to become a new person in Christ, not, a, not the same old guy, not the same old good guy or bad guy. He wants to make a new person out of you. Amen? Once again, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And then it goes on and says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And I think, and I think we all understand what he's trying to say here is that, you know, you can't, you know, you're not going to get saved by knowledge. It is a heartfelt conviction. A heartfelt that realizes what grace has done in your life. That this free gift that he did, that he took on at the cross, the brutal beating that he took on was to save our souls. Not from just yesterday or today, but our, even our future sins. I mean, to me, that, sometimes that's, that's almost a little overwhelming to, to accept that he, he has the ability to forgive us of the things that we're going to do wrong in the future. Amen? Amen. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message, preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's just another 
certification that, that the reason we are saved is because we believe. Not because of what we know. Now, after we believe, we know something. Amen? And he, and, and he works in our lives to continue to teach us stuff to know, to defend. Amen? So that, you know, he, he didn't leave us down here as orphans. He gave us the Holy Spirit to continue to, to strengthen us and grow us in our walks with him. Amen? So the things that we used to struggle over with before that were not sin, maybe just bad habits, but he continued to work those things out of us. Amen? Says Matthew ten uh, twenty three says, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not no worthy of me. He who finds his life will lo- will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And I think that word is is, is just pretty much self explanatory. That after salvation, the Lord desires something from you. You know, salvation is free, but your walk costs you something. It may cost you friends. It may cost you, you know, maybe even your work, family. But what he's trying to tell you is you're going to gain so much more from that. Amen? And I think as more as you walk your walk in maturity, you're coming to understand that, that the love of Christ is so big in your life that, that the things that you leave behind are going to be minimal. Because the treasures that he has ahead for you are going to be greater. Amen? And I, and, and I believe, you know, the, the promises of the cross in, in the end days. You know, 2 Timothy 3.5 says, Having informed godliness, but denying his power, and from such people turn away. And to me, that's where we're at in this world today. Talking about churches taking the cross out. Talking about, not talking about sin anymore not talking about the Holy Spirit, but really just having a church that is really just a, 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 joint, a coming together place. You know, if you, it wasn't that long ago, I think maybe in the fall, that the, the atheists were talking about starting a church up. They the, wouldn't call it a church, but a meeting place. And actually, there wouldn't be much difference between, you know, their congregation and a lot of churches' congregations because people have accepted so much less and then what the Lord wants to give them. I mean, there's times that, that I believe the Lord's wanting to work in a church, but they haven't felt the move of Christ for so long, they don't understand what it is. Why? Because, first off, the pastor's not ready, and the people aren't ready. There's not a hunger and a thirsting to, to receive the good things of Christ, or even the correction of, of Christ. They've, just, they've come into a routine of showing up on Sundays and getting what they want, a little bit of the Lord. And I tell you, I don't think he's coming back for those people. They, you know, they're, they're saved, but they're... What, what are they getting? What are they getting? You know, I, I just believe that, that in, in the near future that those people, they're going to get colder and colder and colder. Because the Bible continues to tell us, is if, if you read the Word, and they're preaching to the church world, you know, the ten virgins is, is, is a good example. Five full... Five foolish and five wise. That's the church world. That's half the church gone. And that's why we need to be alert and on our toes and, and continually seeking the Lord and continually reading the Word and continually encourage each other. Amen? Yes, Second Timothy 4, three. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. A time will come when they not, will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for, up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Man, I tell you, if we're not, if we're not in that time, we, we are in that time. And that, see what amazes me that, that, that you know, this is, Tim, this is Paul t- uh, talking to Timothy. And back in the years of, well, we probably would have been around 80 A.D., Right? Somewhere in there. Maybe a little bit earlier than that, I think. I can't, but it doesn't matter. But here, 2,000 years later, we're still, we're starting to reap the, the benefits of those teachings. Knowing that in this time, in the end of days, that these words are, are truth. And man, I, I, you know, I would, how heartbreaking do you have to be when you stand before Christ and he says, I never knew you? Hmm? 
And I said, man, I went to church every week. He says, you did? You did? Where were you the rest of the week? Where was your heart? Your mind went out of routine. Your body went out of routine. But where was you with your heart? Now, he's not talking about perfection, but he's talking about a heart love that only we can have for the Lord. Amen? And that's what Paul writes as as a warning in Philippians. He says, For many uh, whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. You know, and I believe that with Paul, that it was a desire of his heart, knowing that there were many headed to hell. That many had started the right walk, but veered off path. And their ways was ways of destruction. It says, uh, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And you know, we see that even today. You know, pastors preaching for profit. <laughs> you don't, anybody can realize that. You know, when the message is break your heart and bring tears to your eyes and humble your spirit, you know they're of God. But when they're wanting to retrieve from your pocket, you know, the Lord doesn't speak that very often about money and, and messages on money. And I tell you what, if the, if, if the pastor's got your heart, if the Lord's got your heart, he's got your billfold. Amen? Because you're so willing to give. And you don't need a man to prompt you to encourage you to keep giving so he can build his kingdom. Amen? But at the end of it, he exhorts, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And that's what brings me back to the cross, is that sometimes as you sit down and think and, and realize of the last few days of his life, knowing that, you know, even as Paul knew, I think Paul knew he was, he was headed to the to, to death, but Christ knew he's headed to death, going back to the Father, so shall we. We'll get that way too, if we stay in Christ. But we're not going to carry that burden of sin. We're not carrying that sacrifice. See, our Lord Jesus, he carried that sacrifice and laid it before the Lord so that we would never have to do that. That we could stand on the promise as long as we stayed in Christ. That he would... He would look upon us in a filtered system as he looked through the blood of his son. Amen. Man, we, we've got a deal that, that you can't beat here on earth. Amen. And when we get to heaven and, and John sits down and talks about them ten dimensions with I don't know who, I, I think I'm going to have to be back in that class to get a little bit more understanding. But I, I, maybe we'll understand that ten dimension thing then. And up then he can preach as long as he talks as long as he wants. Amen. Because uh, your butt won't get tired up there. <laughs> it, was just, it, was a glo- it was a good. It was a good preaching, and, and we got the we we got the, the opportunity to go out with uh, John, his wife, and, and we had a good time, and and uh, um, I think the boys had a good time, and, and uh, to understand that his heart is upon the lost. You know, I mean, he. I think he was pumped pretty high when when they, they stood up for salvation, and and. Uh, I mean, that's, we should be too. I mean, even though John did the preaching, we did the welcoming, we did uh, the inviting, we, you know, I mean, we're, it's all family, it's a family deal, amen? And we should never, never take for granted the move of the Holy Spirit, amen? Okay, that's all I got tonight. Um, the only thing I want to close with is in prayer for quite some time. And I, and, and I want to say, I don't know if I, I don't want to say it with an agitated heart, but I say, Lord, I see so much evil getting the platform in this world today. And it aggravates me. I said, when are you going to let your people have a platform? When are you going to let good oversee evil in this world? And I tell you what, my heart was broken not too long ago when I seen Martin Burnett and Roman Downey. Now, that's touched by an angel girl. And they're coming out with the film, uh, Son of God. 
I'm telling you what, they got the platform. And you know what? Not only is Hollywood listening, but the media is listening. I believe it's a great opportunity for the church world right now. You know, everybody kind of laughed when uh, um, the Duck Dynasty guy started the, this little uproar about homosexuality. Even though he's telling the truth, he was a little crude about the way he told it. But he was telling the truth. And the problem is the world didn't want to hear it. But with this movie, I believe it's an opening. And I just pray that, that people that don't have salvation... Or maybe they're sitting in a place where, you know, they're satisfied and they think they're saved. This movie will bring them to, to their knees. That there may be a, a, a great outpouring. We, we've got to have something that's going to stir, stir the Christian hearts and, and the unsaved hearts. Because if the Lord's coming back, He promised that He's coming back for a church that's on fire, that's spotless. That means we're all going to be, the, the real church is going to be in unity. And I just pray that with this platform, the good triumphs in this world for a while. Amen? If you get the opportunity, go see it. I know, I know where we are. And I'm not up here to say that as a commercial. But I just know every time that they would show tidbits, my heart was broke. For people that would have never seen Peter walking on the water. I haven't seen that. But uh, even the crucifixion. I believe is in there. And I'll tell you one thing that I know it's of God because they were interviewing uh, uh, those two on, the, on uh, TBN. And Paul Crouch's son was really giving the fellow a hard time. And finally, she, she spoke up and says, I am so thankful that God gave me a man like him. She, she stopped that foolishness, you know. And I think one of the next questions was, uh, it might have been on there on Fox News, says, well, the devil was portrayed by somebody that looked like Obama, you know. And she, he said, did you change that? She said, yes, I did. Because I didn't want nothing to take away from the message of Christ. And I thought, you know what? She's worthy of that platform. Amen. And I'm not lifting her up, but she's doing her job in the Christian, in the, in the Christian kingdom. Amen. Amen. Anybody got anything to add to or take away? Uh, There's another movie coming out in March too. It's got a really good Christian value storyline to it. It's called God's Not Dead. I don't know if you've seen the previews of that or not. It's about a college student that's in a a, a, a philosophy class, and the the teacher or the professor doesn't believe in God, or he says God's dead, and he wants all of the students to admit in the class that God's dead. And this one boy refuses to admit it, and they have to have a debate on the subject. It looks like it's going to be a really powerful movie about, you know, a real-time, you know, movie about, you know, God's existence and God, why God does things in the world that, you know, lets things happen in the world and, and allows things to happen in the world. It just looks like it's that are really good, and it's got a lot of strictly actors in that movie that are strictly Christian actors. They don't do any other movies but Christian movies. So. Yeah. I'd say it's our, it's our time. If uh, if you're believing like I am, the Lord's coming back, and I believe that the, the Bible said it's the groundwork for us to know that the, that the season's here, and uh, it's a time for us not to be quiet. It's time to support those that are that are on the front line. Because it won't be long, we'll be on the front line. You know, just like Nehemiah, we're building the, the wall. And you've got to have your sword ready. And uh, I believe that time's now. Amen. Why don't you stand on your feet and we're going to close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your presence here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for your people with patient hearts and and lives, Lord, to receive your word. And we just ask, Lord, that, that Lord, that the word have been encouragement to them, that, Lord, as they look forward to Sunday services, Lord, that you'll minister to them, and, Lord, that you'll encourage them in their walk. We just ask for not only your protection, uh, but, Lord, that your Holy Spirit that uh, continues to show us your way. We love you tonight, Lord, thanking you for the opportunity, and thanking you for your people. As we head home, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.